Recently been bragging to others that he was completing a V. 
Corey said that Jesse had told him that in August of 2023, he had been followed home by a cop car. Quote, Jesse called me. He was frantic. He said, Corey, last night, this morning, I was sleeping in my bed and I had the feeling someone is standing over me at the end of my bed watching me. And when I woke up, they stole my phone and wallet. I bolted after them in Paddington. He never retrieved his phone, but someone found his wallet and messaged him on Instagram, end quote. Jesse would later find that his Instagram page was glitching and his followers were being removed from his account. His list of phone contacts also was changing and people were being blocked from contacting him. So whoever had taken his phone was playing around with his contact list. Police spoke of this much later and they said that Bo had used a key to enter Jesse's home. The police allege, quote, he took possession of Jesse's phone and deleted contacts and messages out of that phone before leaving the premises, end quote. Corey spoke of another situation that happened to Jesse. Quote, Jesse would be at a cafe with another guy having coffee, and he would get text messages from Bo saying, I hope you're enjoying that coffee with that other guy, end quote. So, clearly, Bo was somewhere watching him from a distance. So, Corey said, quote, I told Jesse go to the police, but he was scared an allegation about him might arise and I might lose my AFL career, end quote. Jesse said that he told Corey to go to the police with this, but Jesse was too afraid that somehow he would lose his AFL career, the uh, Australian football uh, umpire career, if, you know, there was too much drama out in the news about him regarding this situation. Corey said, quote, they were friends, but when Bo began filming them and putting videos on Instagram, which were hidden from Jesse, making it look as if they were a couple. Jesse told him we can't be friends anymore, end quote. In November of 2023, Jesse wrote up a text message that he was planning on sending to Bo. First, he sent the message to Corey to make sure it sounded good. Here's a little background on Luke Davies. 
international flights. At that time, he moved into a new home in Waterloo, in Sydney's inner suburbs. He loved traveling, and this was absolutely a dream come true for him. He has been described as friendly, loving, caring, cheeky, adventurous, genuine, and kind. He had lots of friends. Now let's move to the days that led up to the crime. It sounds like these days began as very happy ones for the new couple, Luke and Jesse. So on February 5th, 2024, Jesse and Luke went public with their new relationship with a photograph of themselves at Palm Beach on Sydney's northern beaches. So I assume that Bo probably saw that post. February 7th, they posted pictures together while wine tasting in the New South Wales Hunter Valley. February 9th and 10th, they attended a pink concert at Sydney's Allianz Stadium. February 18th, they attended the Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras Festival at Sydney's inner city, Beresford Hotel. On February 19th, which is the date of the crime, they returned to Jesse's $3 million rented home in the town of Paddington in Sydney. They were filmed in CCTV footage in the street outside, but were never seen again. Two days later, on February 21st, at 11 a.m., a groundskeeper at Club Cronula in Sydney, which is 18 miles away from Jesse's home, this groundskeeper discovered bloody possessions and clothing belonging to Luke and Jesse in the garbage can. He found a credit card, an $88,000 watch, a phone, and a wallet, and he alerted the police. At 1 p.m., the police showed up at Jesse's home. They found bloodstains on the furniture and the floorboards. The place was a mess, but there was no trace of the two men. There was a spent 40 caliber cartridge case on the kitchen counter and bullet holes in the kitchen walls. They went and checked Luke's home in Waterloo, but there was no sign of them there either. Detectives began to investigate the case and they came to suspect Bo Lamar Condon. They found out that he had been involved with Jesse in the past and that it had been a bad breakup. Although they were supposedly not in a real relationship that they could have broken up from, but they had not ended their friendship on good terms, let's just say. And they realized that Bo was also missing. They couldn't find him. So here is what they began to find out. They found that Bo had stolen bullets from a shooting range and signed out a police-issued handgun on February 16th. So now remember, the crime happened on the 19th. So on the 16th, three days before, he got the handgun, okay, in preparation for this. Organization had hired Bo 
public policemen to work as security guards for their private event, and they pay for it. They pay the government for this. So anyway, on Saturday, February 17th, Bo had purchased a surf bag in Sydney, and that day he also deleted his social media accounts. On Monday, the 19th of February, at 9 a.m., CCTV captured Bo exiting a black SUV near Jesse's house. And at 9.50 a.m., Jesse's neighbors heard gunshots coming from his home, but they had not reported it. So they heard it. They didn't think it was that big of a deal, I guess, and they only brought it up when the police questioned them days later. At 9.54 a.m., so four minutes after the neighbors heard the gunshot, a call had been made from Luke Davies' cell phone to the police. He could be heard saying, quote, Get out, F off, end quote, and then the call was disconnected. Now, later on that same day, the 19th, it was found that Bo had returned the police-issued gun, and he went to purchase a second surf bag. It is believed that he purchased the first surf bag because he intended on putting Jesse's dead body in it. He didn't know there would be two people there that morning, so he needed to go and buy another bag now because he had allegedly killed two people, not one. So after he got the bag, then he went to rent a white Toyota minivan from the airport. CCTV footage of this white van was captured in front of Jesse's home on Tuesday the 20th. So he went back the next day with the van to retrieve the bodies. Also this day, text messages were sent from Jesse's phone to his roommates. See, he lived with some other people in that $3 million rental. So he told the roommates that he was moving to Perth in Western Australia and asked them to sell or throw out his belongings. Now, who do you think actually sent those text messages? February 21st, Bo and a female friend who supposedly knew nothing about what was going on, they took the white man out for a drive to a rural property in Mongonia, which is two hours from Sydney. Along the way there, Bo stopped at a hardware store and bought an angle grinder and a padlock. When they got to the property, he had the woman friend wait at the gate. He uh, cut off 
also vanished. On February 23rd at 10.30 a.m., Bo decided to turn himself in to the police, and he was immediately arrested and charged with two counts of murder. The police still had not found the bodies of Luke or Jesse, and they continued to search. Divers searched the dams in Bogonia with no success. They spent a lot of time looking everywhere that they could think of. But finally, on February 27th, Bo drew them a map showing them how to find the bodies. They were in Bogonia, stuffed in the surf bags and placed behind a mound of dirt in a shallow grave next to the entrance to the Greek Orthodox Holy Monastery of St. Fenurios Church. So it seems that he was not successful in weighing their bodies down in the water, so he had taken them back out of the water and put them in this shallow grave. Now, police believe that Luke Davies was not an intended target, but just happened to be at the house when Bo Lamar Condon broke in to commit the murder on February 19th. Bo allegedly then shot them both, wrapped their bodies in a tarp, and hid them at the back of the property before he rented the van later that evening and returned to get the bodies. So after he shot them, he wrapped them up and hid them outside of Jesse's house and then came back later with the van so he could take them away. I'm thinking maybe he thought that if he had just killed Jesse like he had planned, he would have been able to take him in the black SUV. I don't know. He is currently in protective custody at Silverwater Correctional Center and is due to appear at Sydney Downing Center Local Court on April 23rd. And that is the case. What are your thoughts? I will share some of mine. First of all, rest in peace to Luke Davies and Jesse Baird. What a senseless crime. Two young men leading successful lives, and it's all ripped away from them for no reason whatsoever. Especially Luke, who was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. He wasn't even the intended target. Not to say that Jesse deserved it any more than Luke, but just bringing that up, something that we all realize. Now, what do I think about this crime, other than the fact that it was a heinous crime? Absolutely horrible, evil crime. Well, I do believe that it was premeditated. I think there's almost no doubt that it was. This was not a crime of passion kind of thing. It wasn't a heated moment, a moment of rage. This is something that Bo had been planning out for at least a few days. And we know that because he had gotten the gun ahead of time. He had gotten the bullets from a place. I had heard somewhere that he thought if he had used these certain bullets from the shooting range that he had stolen, that it would throw off the investigation, that they would not know that he had shot them out of his police gun. That's just something I heard on a video where someone was discussing it. I don't know if that's accurate. But so he did those things well in advance. He bought a surf 
sounds very strange is even though he was doing so much to try to hide the crime there were so many things that he shouldn't have done why did he take a woman with him to Bungonia that first day like why and why did he go to a friend's house and tell her that he needed to clean blood out of his van and talk all that stuff about hiding the bodies why was he doing that and so then he he turned himself in I guess he realized it was a useless battle and then he even went so far as to tell them where to find the bodies so he's not gonna have much of a defense you know it's very clear what he did it's clear that he did it there's no question so I would say the best thing that he could do for himself is to plead guilty and hope that they give him an easier sentence than if he had said not guilty and dragged the whole thing through court. But why did it come to this? I mean, we see a pattern here that we have seen in other crimes. Clearly, he was an obsessive type of guy. He was obsessed with these celebrities. That's how he got into that whole celebrity blogging thing to begin with. And I guess he was doing pretty well because he really found the, you know, big names and got photos with them. And then he meets this guy who clearly does not want to be in a real relationship with him. And he's lying and telling people that they are in a relationship and he's posting things online and hiding it from Jesse so Jesse doesn't know. And he's trying to control who Jesse interacts with by, you know, changing the contacts on his phone list and in his Instagram, you know, trying to cut certain people out of his life following him, so he was stalking him, and then it came to murder in the end. It's just a very, very sad, sad thing that happened. Were there red flags? Well, yeah, there were red flags that something was going wrong there for sure, and Jesse didn't want to report it to the police because, well, number one, Bo was a police officer, so that was a complication. And he was already in the public eye and didn't want to bring any, you know, questionable publicity his way, so you can't fault him. But um, that is about all I have to say about this case. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found it to be thought-provoking. I look forward to seeing